Welcome, friends. We will get started in just a moment. Welcome everyone. Thank you to everyone who's joining us live for today's Lunch and Learn, Milk with Dignity. And thank you to everyone who is watching the recording. If you're watching on YouTube today, please hit that thumbs up button to like this video and help Maine Conservation voters continue to offer programming like the one that you're about to enjoy. Last year, Maine Dairy Farms produced 554 million pounds of milk from about 26,000 cows. Without a reference point, that sounds like a lot. But over the last two years, Maine has lost a quarter of its dairy farms. And the thanks to the escalating costs of production, the labor shortage, the impact of climate change, and many other factors. Today, there are fewer than 160 dairy farms statewide. Even with this precipitous decline, milk is big business. Maine dairy farms pay out more than $710 million a year in wages to 4,700 employees and support another 10,000 indirect employees. According to the Maine Milk Commission, the industry's total economic impact tops $2.7 billion. It's fair to say that Maine dairy farms sit at the heart of Maine agriculture and Maine identity. Many of the remaining dairy farms in Maine are small family operations, while others have thousands of cows producing millions of pounds of milk each year. What are the working conditions like on these farms? And what rights do farm workers have when it comes to wages, breaks, time off, housing, and organizing? A few months ago, our friends at Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, MAFCA, connected us with Migrant Justice. Migrant Justice is a Vermont-based organization committed to building economic justice and human rights for farm workers. For the past couple of years, their campaign have focused on urging Hannaford supermarkets to ensure dignified working conditions on dairy farms throughout New England. We are eager to hear about this work together. With us today is Madeline Shero, who's an organizer with Migrant Justice. She may be joined at some point today by Marita Canedo, who's also an organizer with Mar Migrant Justice. Along with their partners and immigrant dairy workers in the Migrant Justice movement, they spent the last month on the road connecting with supporters in more than 50 cities across seven states and taking action for milk with dignity. Their tour included six stops in Maine, where they met with legislative leaders and labor allies and local organizations as they urge Hannaford to source its store brand milk from the farms where workers' human rights are independently monitored and protected and the long-term interests of farm owners are supported. We are so excited to have you with us today, Madeline. My name is Kathleen Neal. I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy. And MCV does that by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. Since 2020, this weekly online Lunch and Learn series has helped us advance all of those goals, creating a shared space to explore means environmental and social history, policy priorities, climate action movement, and more. We are so glad that you're a part of that program. Thanks for being with us, everyone. A few notes before we get started. We're gonna hear from Madeline first and then tackle questions in the Q&A session at the end. 
As always, you can send questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you. I'll keep track and compile the ones with similar themes, and we'll get to as many of them as possible in the Q&A session. We ask that you not message our speakers directly as we want their focus on the presentation, not the chat box. If you have any technical difficulties today, message Will Sedlak and he can help you out. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous programs. We also have a number of different playlists on YouTube that can help you focus in on particular topics. So have fun and let us know what resonates. All right. I think that's all the logistics. And Madeline, I'm ready to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm just going to maneuver over to uh, sharing my screen. Okay. Um, no, thank you for that that wonderful welcome. Um, and thanks so much for having us. Um, as you heard, I'm going to be uh, sharing some slides and talking about migrant justice. And then hopefully um, another organizer named Marita Canedo will be joining us part ways through. Um, and so, yeah, um, as you heard, my name is Madeline. Um, I'm part of the migrant justice team and um, my work with the organization primarily um, is with allies and volunteers and supporters. Um, and we're just coming back, as you heard, from being on the road for the whole month of April. Um, meeting with groups around the Northeast region. And as you heard, um, spent a, a week actually in Maine, um, meeting with different organizations and community groups and student groups um, and legislators around the region. Um, so really excited to be connecting with you all um, today as well. Um, so I wanna start by um, sharing um, a little bit about migrant justice in general. Um, Migrant Justice is a, a grassroots organization that was founded um, and continues to be led by the immigrant farm worker uh, community in the Northeast. And the mission of the organization is to build the voice, capacity, and power of the farm worker community, and also to engage with, with allies to advance human rights and also economic justice. Migrant Justice got started um, about a little bit more than 13 years ago um, now, actually um, after a, a tragedy where a, a young farm worker named Jose Obeth was killed um, in a, an accident, a work accident um, at a dairy farm in uh, the Northeast part of Vermont. And this accident that, that we believe could have been prevented with um, better training, with safer staffing, um, ended up revealing uh, a community of more than uh, a thousand immigrant farm workers um, who are, whose work is um, sustaining the dairy industry in Vermont and also around the region. Um, and so this, this tragedy, this death ended up being a spark that caused the, the farm worker community to, to start to come out of the shadows and start to get connected and start to, to talk to each other and as well um, talk to, to other community members um, about the, the issues that they were facing um, and start to get organized. So this led to um, various campaigns and different wins over the years. Um, farm workers have focused on gaining access to driver's licenses, um, also um, on policies to keep um, local police from engaging in, in immigration enforcement but over the years has really uh, maintained this focus on the right to fair work and dignified housing. Um, and as you heard, migrant justice is uh, primarily based in Vermont, but more and more um, farm workers in Vermont have been connecting with farm workers around the Northeast region, um, including the state of Maine. And um, I wanted to share some general context also um, that um, in Vermont and around the, the rest of the country, um, it's really immigrant labor that's sustaining the, the dairy industry and also the food industry in general. Um, 
80 to 90 percent of non-family workers on dairy farms uh, are immigrants coming uh, primarily from Mexico and also Guatemala. Um, the work, I'm sure many of you are familiar with dairy farm work, is, is year-round. It's not seasonal um, and it's, it's really 24-7. Um, farms in, in the Northeast tend to be smaller than the, the really big farms we see out West, um, many of which are, are still family farms um, here in, in this area. And, um, oftentimes farms are in very rural places, um, you know, the dirt roads, the end of dirt roads. Um, and so this kind of, um, physical isolation has really led to, um, the community, the migrant farm worker community being, um, invisible to, to many people. Um, as I said, the, the work on dairy farms is year round. And also um, it's important to know that farm workers live where they work and work where they live because um, housing on farms is almost always provided, whether that's on the same property nearby, um, sometimes even in the, in the barns or above, above the barn. And um, with that, I want to share uh, a short video with you all um, so you can hear directly from farm workers um, talking about the conditions on farms um, and also uh, some of the organizing to start getting into what, what is milk with dignity, um, where does it come from, how does it work, um, and then um, I'll share more about the, the current campaign that we're in uh, with Hannaford. So I'm going to put that on. On May Day 2015, farm workers from Vermont publicly called on Ben and Jerry's to be responsible for the working conditions in their supply chain by joining the Mill with Dignity program. Mi nombre es Telma Gómez y soy parte del Comité de Coordinación de Justicia Migrante. Estuve en un rancho en el que la casa estaba en el mismo rancho y, y no habían baños y eran muchas horas de trabajo, no se pagaba ni el, ni el mínimo y no había día de descanso. Y en otro también donde vivíamos en una casa donde no había calentón y en tiempo de frío era muy fuerte y también se iba el agua. El motivo por el que yo me involucré a Justicia Migrante fue por las ganas de cambiar la situación aquí en Vermont, porque queremos trabajos dignos y que nuestros derechos sean respetados, porque no importa de qué parte del mundo vengamos, tenemos derechos. <risa> about 1,500 migrant farm workers helping to sustain the dairy industry in Vermont. Creo que los farmers han decidido contratar la mano de obra migrante porque entienden que es un trabajo muy rudo y muy difícil que pocas personas quieren hacer. Soy Enrique Balcázar, soy organizador con Justicia Migrante. Eh, bueno, estamos llegando al rancho donde, donde trabajé hace tres años, donde comencé a trabajar. He trabajado en cuatro ranchos, pero este fue el rancho donde me tocó trabajar primero y un rancho donde ya está cerrado, donde ya no hay vacas. Y, y vemos la, la realidad, no hace 60 años en Vermont existían alrededor de 11.000 ranchos, ahora existen menos de 1.000 y esto es triste, ¿no? Por, por los bajos precios de la leche, por las grandes corporaciones presionando, ¿no? oprimiendo ¿no? a los ranchos. Y es triste ver esta realidad. The downward pressure that retail corporations put on farms also can create poor conditions for farm workers. Según resultados de una encuesta hecha por Justicia Migrante en 2014, 40% no recibimos el pago mínimo de Vermont. 40% no tenemos día de descanso. 29% trabajamos más de 7 horas sin un descanso para comer. 20% tenemos el primer cheque retenido ilegalmente. 30% hemos tenido enfermedad o accidente debido al trabajo. Muchos patrones te toman como, como un instrumento más para 
producir dinero y no como para no como una persona como como persona humana ¿no? hay personas que todavía ganan a 7 a 650 dólar por hora Yo soy uh, un empleado trabajador en los ranchos de aquí de Vermont. Me he visitado sin querer tres veces en las frontera sí. por accidentes del trabajo. Así. Fue que, que cayó cloro en mi ojo y este, pues sí, tuve que ir ahí de emergencias ahí en el hospital de Burlington y ahí estuve como unas 12 horas ahí le estuvieron lavando y pues todo. Pues. La segunda vez fue en el otro siguiente trabajo donde yo estaba lavando con unos tanques de donde se guarda la leche. Ah, explotó la botella y ya fue que me corté el dedo y, y, y no, pues fue un poco fiero, pero bueno. Igual en ese momento yo dejé de trabajar y me llevaron al hospital y luego... Um, sí, tuvo solución, lo curaron y todo, pero tuve como dos días sin trabajar y eso no fue pagado también. Yo trabajé aquí en la ciudad de Perry, donde me tocó con un rancho, pues que no. Tenía condiciones para vivir, uh, la casa estaba fea, que era una traila donde vivíamos cuatro personas, dormíamos ahí. No era una vivienda digna para un trabajador que se la pasa trabajando 12 12 o 13, 14 horas al día para llegar a descansar en un espacio así, pues, ¿no? Tampoco teníamos espacio de privacidad para estar ahí o platicar en privado o algo, ¿no? Un problema más difícil que nosotros tuvimos fue que eh, un día se descompuso el baño y las aguas negras se vinieron a la luz. Todo estaba feo, pues, y ya hubo un día que decidimos salirnos ya así nomás. Un día de cheque, el problema que teníamos ahí, que teníamos semana prensada. El dinero era alrededor de 800 dólares por persona. Nosotros éramos cuatro que de decidimos abandonar el trabajo porque no, ya, no era, ya no era bien para nosotros. No, no podíamos ser esclavos de eso. Bueno, mi nombre es Ricardo. Vengo de México. And this is the only heat you have in the house, Yeah, that's all, that's all that we got. We got big crack over here. We tried to put some wood and all the house smoke all the way. All the way around. I mean, it's bad. He put these tubes over here and because he don't want to put a heater on. And he think all the heat in the kitchen is going to come to the room. And that don't make no sense. He put this uh, plastic on it, but it's not really good enough. A veces no comía porque a veces el tiempo no me daba. Tenía que trabajar las 18 horas corridas desde las 4 de la mañana hasta las 9, 10 de la noche. Mi nombre es Cirilo Pérez. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Patricio Antonio. Me siento a gusto porque la verdad los patrones han sido buena onda con nosotros. Nos han tratado bien. Al igual que en cualquier trabajo, cuando empiezas al principio, pues te pagan un sueldo un poco bajo y con el tiempo como vas aprendiendo te van aumentando. Y ahorita llevo cuatro años, este, la verdad, me pagan bien, pues creo que es un trabajo digno. Más que nada una buena vivienda, nos dan un cuarto cada persona y una cocina y... Más que nada todo lo que tenemos siempre está funcionando, como la calefacción y casi nada nos hace falta. Siempre tenemos todo y si algo falla, pues hablamos con ellos y ellos lo arreglan. Como quisiéramos ver que todos los compos estén como nosotros, ¿verdad? Ahora estoy en un lugar donde hay mejores condiciones pero los ranchos por los que yo pasé siguen siendo igual y siguen habiendo compañeros que siguen siendo explotados y queremos que cambie eso realmente. No puede seguir la situación así. Hoy nos estamos organizando para cambiar el poder y para que los farmers y farm workers tengan una voz en la industria. 
queremos ser ya reconocidos por todo el esfuerzo que hacemos para crear los productos muy famosos de Vermont. Ben and Jerry es uno de los compradores más grandes de leche en Vermont. Han hecho una marca muy poderosa anunciando que sus productos vienen de comercio justo y el 90% de su crema viene de, viene de los ranchos de Vermont y leche con dignidad hace que, que esto verdaderamente sea justo. Hay muchas personas que se toman un vaso de leche todos los días y, y se preguntan, no, no se preguntan de dónde viene la leche. Hey, la leche viene de las vacas, pero las vacas no se ordenan solas. Nuestro programa Leche con Dignidad es un programa que está basado en el modelo exitoso de Fair Food Program de la Florida. Y tiene cinco componentes esenciales. Eh, un, un elemento esencial son los estándares que son de, están definidos por nosotros los trabajadores que representan dignidad. Dos, educación, que el trabajador conoce y exige sus derechos. Tres, el tercer partido, que este ayuda a monitorear y enforzar los estándares. Cuatro, bonos, que este es un reconocimiento, un premio para a los participantes, tanto al trabajador y a los rancheros. Y cinco, un contrato legal, que este da validez a todo el programa. Esto no funciona sin, sin un contrato legal. El 20 de junio, 17 ciudades del país se unieron para ir a tiendas para llamar a Ben Jerry's a que tome acción, exigiendo que los derechos humanos de los trabajadores sean respetados. Hemos dado un gran paso y los consumidores han sido parte importante de esto. Y para seguir adelante necesitamos de su apoyo para luchar y asegurar que todos los trabajadores de la industria lechera tengan un nuevo día de dignidad, de respeto y derechos. Ya vemos el valor de levantarnos y subir la voz. En defensa de los derechos podemos lograr grandes cosas. Y solo estamos empezando. Queremos leche con dignidad. Queremos leche con dignidad. Queremos leche con dignidad. A los niños educando. Trabajar es una lucha. Nuestra gente bien lo sabe. Pero se ve y se escucha. Que aquí solo fuerza cabe. Que aquí solo fuerza cabe. So, since Ben and Jerry's signed on to the Milk with Dignity program in 2017, um, Ben and Jerry's has implemented Milk with Dignity within 100% of their Northeast supply chain. And so, oops. Okay. And so, what that means um, is that Milk with Dignity right now is covering about 200 farm workers. Um, and represents um, about 20% of the dairy industry in Vermont, as well as some farms also uh, in upstate New York. And through the, the Milk with Dignity program, um, there have been in incredible um, changes and impacts. Millions of dollars uh, have, have gone directly from the, the Ben and Jerry's company into the pockets of farm workers uh, in the form of things like um, raises to salaries, um, bonuses, paid vacation days, paid sick days, improvements in housing, uh, and many more. 
And in addition to that, um, farm owners, um, farmers themselves are getting uh, an eco economic relief um, through this program as well um, because of the premium that Ben and Jerry's pays to farmers for their participation in the program. Um, so that's a really important part of how Milk with Dignity works. Um, and this is why we say that a, a new day has, has arrived to the dairy industry. Um, but uh, while 20% of, of the dairy industry is a, is a, a big uh, first step and a great start, that still leaves many farms outside um, of the, the Milk with Dignity program where um, farm workers are, are experiencing abuses to their rights and farm owners are, are struggling under economic uh, conditions and closing their doors. So um, the question then for, for the organization is how do we expand this program uh, and bring it to more farms? And so the Farm Worker Leadership Committee for Migrant Justice, after a lot of analysis of the industry, decided to focus on the supermarket Hannaford um, as the, the target of, of the next Milk with Dignity uh, campaign. And um, Hannaford has, I'm, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with Hannaford or, or shop at Hannaford. Um, it's a big uh, dairy uh, chain in Vermont, also uh, very important for the state of Maine, of course. Um, and all across the Northeast, there's almost 200 stores. Um, so Hannaford is a, a, a really um, large buyer of dairy in the region and also um, a big um, retailer of dairy under um, their Hannaford store brand. So in 2019, uh, farm workers um, reached out to the, the Hannaford company to try and initiate a, a conversation, have a discussion, um, start to, to look at, um, you know, see, see what Hannaford thinks of the program and, and if um, there could be some way to, to work together on this. Um, and when farm workers received no response, they decided to launch a public campaign calling on Hannaford to join Milk with Dignity. Um, and so over the last three years, farm workers have used a lot of different um, strategies and tactics um, to build pressure to, to call on Hannaford to join Milk with Dignity. Um, and it's been in a lot of ways similar to the campaign with Ben and Jerry. Some of the things you saw in the video are things that farm workers um, have been also doing, like rallies, um, marches, um, pickets, um, um, uh, a, a tour, <laughs> which you were just hearing about. This was actually the second tour that farm workers did um, for the, the Hannaford campaign. And consumers have also been a really important part um, of this, um, sending thousands of emails, making thousands of phone calls, um, keeping up constant pressure um, over social media. And um, solidarity from other organizations has also been really important, um, as well as actually even working with investors in Hannaford's um, parent company, which is actually a, a multinational European company, called Ahol Delhazy, um, where um, farm workers have also organized with investors and shareholders in the company to, to bring uh, Milk with Dignity to, to that level as well. And so while we've seen Hannaford responding to this pressure um, by trying to find ways to, to make their brand look good in the face of um, of farm workers um, and claiming that everything is fine on the farms where they buy their milk from. Um, they have not come to the table to, to speak with farm workers um, or to, to make a move to join this program. Um, and so the, the campaign with Hannaford continues. And um, in the last couple of minutes that we have before we open it up for discussion, um, I'm gonna talk about some ways to, to get involved and um, to, to stand with farm workers and to, to join the call for Hannaford to, to join Milk with Dignity and support uh, dairy farms and, and migrant farm worker rights. So 
something um, that's really exciting um, and is going to be the next big step for, for this campaign is that farm workers are planning a march, which is actually going to be in Maine, uh, in Portland, because um, the corporate headquarters for Hannaford is, is located really nearby in Scarborough. Um, so farm workers are calling on supporters from all across the region to join us on June 24th um, for a, a massive march um, in Portland. And we'll be sharing after this presentation uh, a form where you can sign up if you'd like to um, to join us or you want more information about you know what time, where to meet. Um, this is also a, a QR code that you can uh, scan with your phone <laughs> real, real quick to sign up as well. Um, but we'll be sure to, to send out more information about this after the, the presentation. Another thing that I mentioned um, has been really powerful is social media action. And this has been a, a really great tool for the campaign with Hannaford because it's a way of using Hannaford's um, public platform as a place to, to build support for Milk with Dignity. Um, so this is an action that's, that's really quick. Um, it's easy if you're on social media already, it's something that you can do from anywhere, but it's really effective um, and has a, has a big impact. So the way that it works is um, whether you're on Facebook or if you're on Instagram, um, you just open up your, your Facebook app or your, your Instagram, uh, Instagram app, look for the most recent post or one of the most recent posts um, that Hannaford is, has um, put out. And they're, they're pretty active, so it shouldn't be too hard to find one. Um, and add a comment. And in your comment, you can, um, you can say whatever you would like to about um, why Milk with Dignity is important to you, why uh, you wanna see Hannaford take this step, why you care about farm worker rights, why you care about local farms. Um, you can get creative. You can do like a, a selfie, take a picture. Um, you could even record a little video. And when you're on there, um, you'll see that this is something that hundreds, I, I think probably at this point, thousands um, of supporters, allies, and farm workers alike have been posting really beautiful um, testimonies and um, videos and, and photos um, calling for calling on Hannaford to join up with dignity. Um, so this is something we really encourage folks to do. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your kids, tell your coworkers. Um, it's uh, something that's really quick, but very impactful. So um, please, please take a moment to, to do this action on social media. Another one, which is sort of like a, a, the, the next step, if you're really motivated and, and you really want to participate and support this campaign, is that we've been working with groups across the region um, to adopt their local Hannaford. And on the screen, you can see uh, a bunch of red dots. Those are all um, locations for, for Hannaford stores. And uh, Maine, Maine has a lot of them. Um, so this is a great opportunity if you're close to a Hannaford, if you shop at Hannaford, um, to adopt your local Hannaford and um, commit to, to doing um, regular reoccurring actions there. And this is really powerful because um, it, it creates a really widespread dispersed um, pressure for Hannaford so that they're, they're constantly hearing about this issue and understanding that it's not something that's just important to like a few people over here or just like a, a few farm workers in Vermont, but it's something that is really um, important to, to consumers um, and, and farm workers alike all across the region. Um, and these actions don't need to be really complicated or large. Um, we actually have a, a toolkit, which you can see the, the link on the screen, but we're gonna share that um, after the presentation as well. Um, but it could be as simple as just, um, you know, next time you're doing your shopping, um, having a conversation with the local manager and just explaining why, why this is something that's important to you and understanding that local managers don't have the decision-making power, of course, for the whole company, but asking them to, to relay this to the, the higher-ups in the company. Um, we also have some um, flyers, little half-sheet flyers that it's something you can turn in um, to the customer service desk when you're doing your shopping. Um, 
if you want to do something more active and actually like hand those out, um, that's something that you can do in the parking lot or you could set up at the entrance. Um, groups have been really creative to, you know, grabbing a, a friend or a family member and um, taking photos, you know, maybe making a, a sign calling on Hannaford to join Milk with Dignity, taking, taking a photo next time you're in Hannaford and then um, posting it on social media. That's a great action and, it, and it's very simple. Um, also groups, there's um, people in areas where, um, you know, maybe you're connected to a, a church group or a, um, a food sustainability group, or maybe you're a student involved in, in student organizing, um, where people have gotten together bigger groups and actually done like a, a mini rally or done like a, a picket in front of their store. So there's a lot of options and um, we're there to support you with this toolkit and happy to, you know, to set up phone calls, set up Zoom calls um, to talk to you more, brainstorm, figure out, you know, what, what makes sense for the group and, and what kind of support you need. Um, so that's another great way to take action. And I think with that, we're coming up on the half an hour. So I'm gonna um, move us to the last slide. Um, which has our social media handles. And I'm gonna take us off screen share um, and welcome my colleague Marita Canedo is here for Migrant Justice. Um, and I think we'd like to use the rest of the time to um, answer questions and, and have more of a discussion. So thanks. Thank you so much, Madeline. And did did you want Marita? Welcome. I'm. I know you had a busy morning, so I'm glad that you were able to join us. And just wanted to to offer you the floor if there's anything you want to share before we get into to Q and A to introduce yourself. Thank you. So my name is Marita Canedo. I'm part of the Mega Justice team and. As Kathleen said, I had like a really busy week, so I'm thankful I was able to come at least for the answer questions. I coordinate the Milk Goodinity program and also the campaign, so we're really excited to have this space today, and hopefully you got inspired but you know, by what Madeleine was sharing with you all, but it's important to see that um, Hannah for understands that it's not a couple of farm workers yelling in the streets in Vermont, but it's really a community uh, worry and concern about the human rights that are happening, you know, with your neighbors. So yeah, please uh, feel free to have any comment or question and, and don't be scared when we call to action. Don't think about only rallies. There are so many ways to take action and call the attention of Hannaford. I love that. Thank you so much. And, and just so everyone knows, you will get a, a follow-up email later this afternoon with the link to the recording of the, the program. You'll also find links to, to the Migrant Justice website, as, as well as ways to sign up for their action alerts. Uh, there's a, a news article about the Milk with Dignity organizing tour that you heard about. We'll share that toolkit for taking action and a link to, to pledge to participate in that march on Hannaford that's going to happen in Portland on June 24th. So there will be lots of ways that you can get involved in this, this very important work. We have a bunch of terrific questions, and I want to encourage everybody to, to keep them coming through the chat. But let's, let's dive right in. Uh, in that really fabulous video. Thank you for sharing that. It, it's so wonderful to, to have both you, Madeline, and you, Marita, with us today, but to see so many of your, your partners in this work. It, it's not just the two of you. I see it's a huge movement. Um, and the, the video cited some survey information about what, what life is like for farm workers in Vermont. Do you have that kind of data for for farm workers in other states in New England or, or beyond, or tell us a little bit more about how it, those conditions are or are not, not the same across the region. Sure, I think our survey only uh, concentrates in Vermont because the success of the survey was like worker to worker and we weren't able to go to out of the state. However, the connections that we have with other uh, farm worker organizations, for example, in New York, they have the report that is called, I think, Milk 
and they have really amazing data and information about the conditions of workers. And also we learn from the workers themselves when they are connected with people here, you know, they have family members or friends that are working in, in farms in New York. We also were able to connect with farm workers in Maine uh, during, you know, the start of this campaign, we had visited the farms. Uh, there are some farms that are doing great and, and workers feel safe. Uh, of course, you know, there are things about the minimum wage or maybe, you know, the protections against just costs or things like that are still not in place uh, because it's not the state law and things like that. But the specific data we don't have, we just have more testimonies and connections with other workers. That makes so much sense. I think I had missed that it was, it, and it, again, it makes sense that there's the survey is worker to worker and you're going to get deeper and richer information from that, but, but there's also a reality of how much you can, you can collect. So thank you. That makes sense. Um, I think a lot of us have assumptions about what, what kinds of farms might be doing better on these fronts and what kinds of farms are, are the sites of more challenges and problematic conditions. I don't want to make those assumptions. So can you fact check me? Like what are there any trends across the region that, you know, where where places are conditions are better or worse? So it's a mix. I think every farm, as we said, it's their own world. So it could be that there is a farm that has really good salaries, but the housing is a problem or the opposite, right? Uh, what we see here is that um, in Vermont, the farms that are near to the border are the ones where people feel uh, more isolated and they depend more of you know, the employer to bring them food because they don't wanna go out to the store. Uh, which brings other dynamics, right? Uh, about you know how much a person can organize in a farm and really speak up because they are really afraid if they are you know fired, they are going to be seen on the middle of the street near to the border, and and there have been occasions that border patrol have thought that somebody that was walking to work thought that person was crossing the border. So that's a situation, and I have to say, you know, the sizes of farms varies from state to state. In Vermont, they are relatively small. It's just like five to seven, the average worker having the smallest with one worker. Those are the most vulnerable, I think, because the person is isolated and doesn't have much uh, knowledge about their rights. Uh, in bigger farms, however, maybe the situation that's complicated is housing. So the biggest farm in Vermont, for example, has around close to 30 workers. And because of that number and where they are located, people are living in, you know, crowded rooms above the, the machinery of the farm or the parlors. And, and that's another thing. Workers are, are making good money and I think they are happy with their schedules. But as I said, you know, that many people are, don't have the proper housing situation. In Maine, what we have seen is that the farms are paying well, there's maybe good treatment, but there are no protections against any like labor dispute, you know, like there's no I know your rights, um, and, you know, like knowledge. Health and safety is a big issue in most farms. You know, people don't get proper training. They learn from other peers about how to do the job. And workers come is another part that maybe it's across all the farms, understanding how that works, how the system, sometimes farm owners want to pay out of pocket, but that doesn't mean it's going to cover everything that the workers come claim could. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers really your question. It does. That, thank you. That is, is really helpful. And it sounds like that variation between across farms and, and across conditions is is really is problematic. Like there's not a, a standard or that sort of um, security of of standards and, and protections in place. I I think that there are some efforts in Maine to to change that right now, right? And and we actually um 
there are a couple of bills in the, the main legislature that would address some of these longstanding inequities that farm workers face. And we are we are lucky to have our good friend Heather Spalding from Mafka on the, the line today. And Heather, I wondered if you could tell us just a little bit about what's happening in the legislature. Uh, and then and then we'll go back, we'll get back into milk with dignity. But but what's happening here in Maine to improve things? Oh, sure. Thanks, Kathleen. And thank you so much, Madeline and Marita, for the incredible presentation and for your amazing efforts to raise awareness um, about this really important issue. Um, yeah, so there are three bills actually relating to farm worker justice um, under consideration in the legislature right now. Um, one is LD 398, um, which is an act to make agricultural workers and other related workers employees under the wage and hour laws. And um, Maine is Maine law um, exempts farm workers from the benefits of um, Maine's minimum wage and overtime. Um, so specifically, farm workers are not considered employees under wage and hour laws that protect almost like every other worker in Maine. Um, and so they're legally, they're only entitled to the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, which hasn't changed in 23 years. <laughs> um, and it's really important to note that most farmers in Maine report that they do pay their workers at at least Maine's minimum wage of $13.80 per hour, and that's voluntary. Um, many say they have to pay well above that and just to get the help that they need. Um, so the labor crisis is real and painful for Maine agriculture, and that's really important to acknowledge. Um, some farmer, farmers also report that they voluntarily pay their workers um, overtime after 40 hours, but most of Maine's farming sector doesn't pay overtime. Um, and another thing to, it's important to note is that some of the larger commodity operations um, hire migrant workers for temporary seasonal work through the federal visa program called H-2A. And that currently um, requires employees, employers to pay $16.95 per hour and um, also to provide housing and transportation um, and some other benefits, but not overtime. So, um, so, you know, we just feel that farm workers are, um, they are essential workers. We believe that they're, they're critical. Um, the work that they do is difficult and extremely dangerous as you've, um, you know, it can be extremely dangerous. Um, and um, the work that they carry out is we all depend on that. And so we feel they should be, they should qualify for the same labor protections that other workers enjoy. Um, so that bill on the minimum wage and overtime was um, heard in the last legislature. It failed to pass. We hope it's back this year and we hope that it's gonna pass in this session. Another bill is LD 525, which is an act to protect farm workers by allowing them to organize for the purposes of collective bargaining. And that would give farm workers the right to organize and join a union and negotiate fair wages and reasonable schedules and without fear of retribution from their employers. And um, again, we feel that these farm workers should have the same rights that other workers do. Um, the National Labor Relations Act doesn't protect farm worker organizing efforts like that. They, they do allow states to enact their own collective bargaining laws and we hope that um, Maine will do that. And actually, again, in the last legislative session, um, that bill was heard and it did pass in the House and Senate, but Governor Mills did not feel that it was um, that Maine was ready for it and she vetoed it and there were insufficient votes in the legislature to override that veto. There's one other bill that would protect the rights of agricultural workers and that basically would say that workers um, would have the right to access to um, essential service providers and also could determine who could who their visitors could be if they're living on the farm. So those are the three bills that are in the works right now. Thank you so much, Heather. I really appreciate appreciate you and appreciate all of your work. Um, it's good to know that there are efforts to change the laws in Maine. And then we also have these efforts to, to go directly to retailers like, like Hannaford and say, do better. Um, so it was 
absolutely fabulous to hear that story of how you guys got got Ben and Jerry's on board. Congratulations. That is big. That's big stuff right there. And I know Hannaford is the target of the, the focus of the campaign right now. Are there other retailers that you have, have worked with? And I'm thinking about Walmart or, you know, a big, big regional or national chains that might be, give us a lot of, a lot of leverage. Yeah. And, and thank you, Heather, for all that, you know, uh, picture of all the efforts uh, uh, with the laws in, in the state of Maine. One thing that we have learned is that while this effort happened, and if the, all those laws hopefully, you know, are going to become real, a big challenge is the enforcement and, and the funding, right? And that's how we connect that hopefully states are going to take milk with dignity as the basic standards when it comes to enforcement mechanisms and also how the, you know, those changes in the farms are going to be paid off. So, um hopefully you know while these efforts are going on we also can explore uh how the state that it's also like a, a they source milk right they are by they are like a buyer can really become part of the the milk community program and and with lost something that we have seen for example in housing there are certain regulations that are under the law, right? Like basic things as ventilation in a room or, um, I don't know, like uh, fire extinguishers. Those are not in place. And unfortunately, it's not because, uh, you know, nobody wants that, but it's the lack of enforcement because of the capacity of investigators at the state level. And that's it's a reality. It's also a crisis of, of work, or, you know, and... I don't know, like we, we're trying to work really close with the Department of Labor in, in you know, VOSHA and OSHA to try to do these regulations, uh, investigations, and they have so many limitations with the, with the status of, you know, uh, of laws and all that. So it's just like, let's figure out a way to also have a way to be able that these laws are going to be enforceable and, and not create something again, but try to have the state really become something that the workers have created it will be amazing. Um, also to add with the unionizing, uh, the, the right of, union, you know, uh, workers, farm workers to unionize. Uh, it's amazing how Melbourne can work together with unions because the protections are so much, uh, you know, intricate, like uh, no fear of retaliation and, uh, you know, access to be negotiating salaries and all that. Uh, workers are already protected under, under milk with dignity and really connects if a farm will be like already belonging to a union and becomes milk with dignity, both things can really come together and make more like power to the workers. Same as if a farm is milk with dignity and then that farm has the right to unionize, boom, the workers already know the rights and have more protection, so adds like layers of uh, of you know work and connections with unions and all that, so it's it's amazing, and it's good to learn about the experiences like for example in New York, where they won this right and still workers are figuring out to can we create our union or do we just join another union, and so having all that education to farm workers is really key, uh, for them to not be. Uh, Sometimes we, we have seen, unfortunately, that unions that weren't part of, of those efforts just come into the state and try to have workers sign up without any explanation about really how they're going to be organizing. So um, just calling to attention that it's really important to, to have all these efforts and that how can we work together in collaboration with that? It's really important. Hopefully, we're going to have Vermont also. We're in conversations as this, you know, following the example of Maine and connecting with what Maine is doing to, to help us expand milk with dignity to the state level uh, and understanding, you know, the contracts that they have. So other targets are like we have a constant table of um, po potential buyers that we keep, uh, you know, doing the research about connections, uh, the impact, who are the people that we need to approach and we keep doing that uh, and things go slow. Not everybody has a public campaign, but 
yeah, it's part of the strategy. It is a it is a lot of work to run a campaign like this across states and communities and. I am just so impressed and so grateful for, for all of the work that you're doing. I don't want to, to suggest another layer of complexity, but is there a Milk with Dignity national in the works? Um, hopefully. So the, the step to bringing Hanafor to join the program, it's the, stat, the strategy there, it's uh, very smart because first we'll bring other states in the Nordic region so we can, you know, expand gradually, which in our capacity, it makes more sense to make a real change and not have like one size fits all, uh, especially talking about the different sizes of farms in, in different states and different laws as well. And the other thing is um, with Hanafor, we know they source from the hood plants. So it's also a uh, you know, step uh, to the door of hood and other um, producers. So we, our dream is that milk with dignity will be all, you know, in all the farms and all the industry and really bringing this economic justice. So um, yeah, hopefully in the future, it's just step by step. Well, remind everybody, you're going to get the link to sign up for Migrant Justice's uh, updates. So you will be the first to know when Migrant Justice or when Milk with Dignity expands to the next level and beyond that. Um, we had one question about, would Milk with Dignity, uh, would all farms be eligible to, to join up? So whether you're a conventional farm or an organic farm or a family farm or a big farm, like, it's open to everybody? So it depends on who signs into the program. With Ben and Jerry's, they only buy conventional, not organic. So organic farms weren't able to join the program. However, the size of farms, we have a very specific plan for small family farms to big farms to join the program. So, and, and also there is like a, a cap for how much money a big farm can receive. So it doesn't take away from small family farms, how much they get. And so we're trying to bring a balance on that. Uh, so for organic farms to join, it will be great to start thinking about targets that are sourcing from organic farms and we had some research you know stony field organic valley but then it's how how the program will be there and and i think it's a call to everybody that has knowledge on the industry you know like how can we do a strategy about different targets and potential buyers that's fabulous that's fabulous um i'm gonna ask one more question which is way bigger than the time we have left but but when Heather, when you said the, the phrase essential workers, I know that that is a, a phrase that has long existed. There have always been essential workers, but there's something about that phrase that just screams pandemic to me <laughs> because it really came to the forefront there. So I, I just want to ask, how has the, the pandemic affected farm workers and and your advocacy and, and organizing work specifically. And this could go for, for any of you, or or you're all saying, oh my gosh, we don't have, we can't do that <laughs> yeah, in two minutes, Kathleen. We can start. <laughs> and and Marita, feel free to add. But um, yeah, I mean, it's had an incredible impact um, in lots of different ways. Um, I think for the Milk with Dignity campaign, um, we were actually li literally on the road um, trying to do a, a tour to bring, spread the word about this, what was fairly new at the time, the beginning of 2020 um, campaign with Hannaford. Um, and we had all these presentations lined up across the Northeast and one by one by one, they, they were getting canceled and we had to come home. So um, the pandemic and social distancing and, and and everything really impacted the campaign and changed um, the tactics that we were able to use. Um, but farm workers really didn't let up the pressure. We we ended up doing things like car caravans and um, social media and phone call. You know, figuring out ways to continue the the campaign. Um, and the idea of that concept of essential workers also um, really. Um, as you say, uh, really uh, kind of changed and got highlighted 
during the pandemic. Um, and that actually turned into a, a side campaign that farm workers um, uh, decided to organize um, a campaign in Vermont to to call on the the state to actually um, provide um, a, a, a stimulus or um, a, a, a benefit for um, farm workers who were uh, excluded from the national um, COVID, COVID funds um, because of their immigration status, um, many people being undocumented. Um, but because of being essential workers always, and, and additionally during COVID and not being able to socially distance on farms or just not show up to work, farm workers continue to, to have to be be working throughout the pandemic, um, that turned into a really uh, important moment to to use that reality to to um, call on the state to recognize workers. Um, and Vermont did end up um, providing a, a an economic stimulus for for workers excluded from the national um, national funds. Um, yeah, that's, I don't know. I love that. That. that is, I mean, that's really actually great news. And I'm looking at Heather. Did Maine do that? I should know. Yeah, I mean, we Maine benefited greatly from a lot of um, you know COVID relief funds for, and and many of the farmers were able to pivot and um, saw some of their best income. I mean, but it was incredibly challenging. Um, you know, as as Madeline was saying, I mean, they couldn't stop. They had to like really scramble and 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 reframe their whole approach and ensure the protection for their workers. And and um, you know, there was a shift in awareness, I think, in the public about where our food was coming from and how tenuous our food supply is. Um, so I think that there is potential. I guess I would say there are so many farms that really are very, very close to the margins, and we have to do everything we can to support farmers and pay farmers a fair price for what they're selling. And we just feel that we can't be balancing the farm economy on the backs of the farm workers. So that's that's really at the at the bottom of this. We have to ensure justice for the farm workers and um, pay the true cost of, of food production. Well said. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, for introducing us to Madeline and to Marita. And thank you, Madeline and Marita, for joining us today. Thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, next week's program, in some ways, is very different and in some ways is a perfect complement. We're going to be talking about jumpstarting Maine's offshore wind industry, different industry, but we want to hold those uh, those core commitments to responsible, good condition, working conditions for the folks who are on the front lines of the industry. You're gonna, we're going to have a whole bunch of terrific partners, including labor partners, with us next week to, to talk about what that looks like. So thanks for queuing it up in a way that wasn't in my mind yet, but I'm definitely going to go into next week thinking about the similarities there. Marita, so grateful for you. Madeline, grateful for you. I'm grateful for all of you. Have a terrific weekend and keep an eye out for that follow-up email this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone.